What is up guys, Rick Kakis here, and today is a very special day, and that's because the day this video is being uploaded is June 12th. Now way back, way way back in 2014, on June 12th, that marks the first day the Destiny Alpha was made available to the public. Myself and thousands of other people took our first steps into Destiny, started our journey that for myself lasted now officially three years. It has been officially three years of Destiny. That is insane. It is so mind-boggling to think of how this game has evolved, where it was in the alpha, in the beta, and during the initial release, to where it has come with the Age of Triumph. And so today, for this three year anniversary, that's exactly what we're going to take a look at. The evolution of Destiny. Talk about its very beginnings, where it started with the alpha, all the way until now with the final expansion, or I should say content edition, free content edition, at the cusp of Destiny 2 releasing. And so, let's get started, because I do feel like this is such an important perspective for many players to have. Millions of players did not start Destiny when it first came out. Now that isn't definitely like a bad thing, it doesn't make you a worse player, but they are missing out on a unique perspective of where this game kind of was and the changes that so drastically impacted the performance and the future of the game. So again, let's get started with, with the alpha, where it all began. The alpha and the beta were pretty darn similar. With the beta for the last few hours of its existence, Bungie actually did open up the ability to go on the moon, but the alpha was just Earth. It was just the Cosmodrome. There was one strike the Devil's Lair. There was an absolutely bare bones PvP offering. It was really just testing out the first little taste of Destiny what it was going to be like, the gunplay, just the most basic levels of the loot system. You could only get to level 8 and you could only get up to green gear. We only saw glimpses of blue gear just before, just before the alpha went offline. The Cryptarch was actually selling blue special weapon engrams and this was our first ever look at that rarity of loot. It's crazy to think, like considering how many blues I delete right now, back in the day that was a big deal, our first glimpse at that next level of rarity. And as you can see, we've got some different layouts in the weapons going on here. It's cool to see like kind of what Bungie was thinking about way back when before they even launched the game in terms of weapon and perk layout. But the alpha and the beta came and went and they were pretty well received. With the main downside of just being so limited, we didn't get a great idea of a lot of the things that Destiny would have to offer. And also, it really conflicted with the final launch of the game. People, their expectations from getting such a limited alpha and beta versus what was actually in Destiny, the release, was quite, quite the point of contention. Because we move on to, again, that release, officially, of the full Destiny game. And boy, was there controversy. It was just... A clusterfuck. It was, there's no other word for it. Destiny did not release to stellar reviews. In fact, it released to quite mediocre ones. It was considered that it was just above par, and that was the consensus from most hardcore gamers, citing the main flaw as not enough content. And guys, if you weren't around then, that complaint was very well founded. When Destiny first released, it did not have the most content, and it had an inherently flawed loot system, an inherently flawed leveling system to boot. Things were not great when the game first came out. 
you had a absolute bare bones, in fact, less than bare bones storyline. That original Destiny storyline is still today the butt of many jokes. And when you're buying a full game at $60, like a full price game, and it has a story mode that tells you that you don't have time to explain why you don't have time to explain, and players are left extremely confused and dissatisfied, that is not a good thing. Now thankfully for Destiny, thankfully, the game wasn't necessarily built around this story. It didn't even have a campaign per se. I mean it did, but the whole aspect of the game was leveling up, grinding, and getting loot. Destiny is a looter shooter at its core, and I think even today a lot of people forget that. So even if the story was subpar, you were really just kind of grinding the story missions to try to get loot, to try to get experience, and then move your way up within the game. Move your way to the strikes, move your way to the nightfall, and eventually, eventually, move your way to the raid. The Vault of Glass raid did not release in the first week of the game. They gave us a week to kind of gear up and get ready, and I think Bungie not doing that was firstly the right choice. Letting players gear up is something that is really important, and I think when they only gave us three days in the Rise of Iron to gear up for the raid, I think that was a mistake. I like getting a week so that everyone can be kind of on an even playing field before diving into the raid. So just kind of throw back Bungie, that was a good idea. But also it skewed the ratings, I think, because the Vault of Glass was the single most impressive piece of console content I've ever played in my life. That raid and the mechanics behind it and getting six players to go in to the Vault of Glass, that is unprecedented for a console game. Bringing a PC-like raid somewhat comparable to what was going on in World of Warcraft and bringing that to the consoles was just it had never been done before at that level. The level of complication and puzzle solving had never been done before at that level in a multiplayer experience and setting at a console game. And that is just unprecedented and that is one of the best parts of the game. Now unfortunately, unfortunately, I say all those things, I sing its praises because I'm one of the elite. Now that sounds douchey, so let me kind of rephrase that. I am one of the people who play this game way too much. And I was able to play and complete the raid because I had a lot of people I was adding. And, you know, I have a YouTube channel for goodness sakes. It was very easy for me to find people who wanted to play the raid with me. But a lot of people out there, even now, don't have those options. And back when the game first launched, they did not. It was even worse. LFGs were extremely bare bones. They were just coming into existence basically because of this raid. You had to find people... It was not pretty, guys. Let me just say that. And so, so many people did not even get to experience the best part of the game. That's not a good thing. Yes, you want to have exclusive endgame content, but to restrict so many people who had the talent, who had the weapons, but just didn't have the people to play with, was a huge mistake on Bungie's part. And you can see Bungie recognizing that mistake now with Destiny 2 and the introduction of the guided game system, essentially in-game matchmaking, and even the clan system so that you can more easily team up with people. Bungie realized this was a mistake and they are definitely addressing it in Destiny 2, which is a good thing. But even with the Vault of Glass being an extremely positive and great piece of content, the leveling system that was in place at the time dragged it down. Because you had to be pretty much as high of a level as you could be to go into the Vault of Glass. The leveling system was extremely unforgiving. If you were one level lower, you did something like 30 to 15 percent less damage and you received 30 to 15 percent more damage. It was incredibly hard to be under leveled when doing a piece of content. But the only way to get to the maximum level at the time which was 30 and guys the enemies in the Vault of Glass were level 2 level 30 was to play the Vault of Glass. So you had to struggle through the Vault of Glass just to get gear so that you could properly do the Vault of Glass. But at the only time where you were properly leveled with your Vault of Glass opponents, 
um, you had all the Vault of Glass gear. Like, to get to level 30, you had to have every single piece of armor being from the Vault of Glass. How silly of a system is that? That you play a piece of content to get all of the gear from that content just so that you can be at parity with that piece of content. Like, it just didn't make sense. And furthermore, this leveling system exasperated the horrible RNG. If you're watching this and you're a year two player or beyond, you have no idea how horrible the RNG in Destiny was. Like, I can say things now, like I think exotics are too easy to get because three of coins makes exotics kind of a joke. And year two players will actually be upset by this because again, they have nothing to compare it to. They can't compare it to the absolute grind fest that was year one. Now this did result in a couple of positives. Making the grinding so severe and making the RNG so low made it so that when you did get exotics, it was unbelievable. Like it was such a big deal. It was really weird being able to go back and kind of think about that time in the game where you would see someone with an exotic and you were legitimately dumbfounded. You would see an exotic and have no idea. I remember seeing the hard light for the first time on one of my teammates in the Vault of Glass and I was like, what is that gun? Wait, like, I had no idea anything about this gun because I would never seen it before. Now, again, exotics flow and so many people have so many exotics that you see them secondhand all the time before you even get them. For the first several months of Destiny, exotics were a rare sight. And then later on, with Xur selling more and more and the RNG system being fixed, and guys, don't be tricked, I'm not advocating for the RNG system, but they got more and more commonplace. But it was a very cool thing having exotics as elusive as they were for a little bit. But again, that is the small light in the overall darkness of the RNG system. The chances to get loot was incredibly small. And you had like hashtag forever 29 for Destiny players stuck without the one piece of Vault of Glass armor they needed to get to level 30. It was really unsatisfying and you felt like you were up against it. It's kind of like opening supply drops in Call of Duties right now. You just feel like the odds are against you. It was that old Activision RNG. RNG, and it was pretty unforgiving. This was accompanied by a very, very unforgiving grind. So let's say that you get a weapon in Destiny right now. You can pop a bunch of moats and level that sucker up in absolutely no time, but this is a relatively new addition. Back with vanilla Destiny, you had to level up a gun by playing with it and by using bounties, and it took forever. And not only that, all of your planetary materials had to come from the planets. You would have to spend, no word of a lie, three to four hours, hours, just running around the moon, collecting helium filaments over and over again, just to level up one single weapon or one single piece of armor. It was very, very unfun. Bungie realized this and that's why things started to change but unfortunately and the reason i kind of talked so long about those systems in place for the vanilla release of the game is that very unfortunately those systems remained in place for the introduction of destiny's first expansion the dark below the dark below hit destiny and quite frankly it solved almost none of these things. It added new weapons and it added a new raid, which was good. New content is always needed. But unfortunately, this new content and this new gear was introduced into Destiny with the flawed leveling system still in place. So you had this new raid, Crota's End, and you had the new raid gear from it. Again, a pretty good piece of content. Like the raids were by far the best parts of Destiny at that point. But there was a higher leveling system that you could reach now. You can now reach, I believe it was level 32. But only the Crota's End raid gear dropped at level 32. This made the Vault of Glass pointless. Once you got Crota's End gear and once you started to level up, you obviously wanted to maintain that highest level possible. So there was just no reason to utilize the older Vault of Glass or frankly any other gear at that time. And the cherry on top was that there was no infusion system whatsoever. Stuff dropped at the light level that it dropped at, and that was it. 
So if you are trying to maintain a high level for something like the Iron Banner in PvP or any PvE activity, you were using the new raid, the Kota Zen stuff, and that was it. Everything else was kind of pointless. It was just a lower light level, period. That was a very bad system. Now, thankfully, in this point of the history of Destiny, things will start to turn around and get a lot more positive. But it's very important to mention, for the launch of The Dark Below and the upcoming launch of The House of Wolves, both of those DLCs were steeped in yet more controversy. Remember that Destiny did not have a great launch. It, like I said before, was criticized for not having enough content. This was not helped by the fact that people simply glitched out of the map and could find areas that came in the Dark Below and the upcoming House of Wolves DLCs that you could go to, that you could move around in, that even some had enemies in but weren't in the game yet. It seems like Bungie had, well, cut this content from the original disc for the purpose of selling it back to the players as DLC. And again, you could go to these places before the DLC ever came out. The DLC came out and, oh, guess what? It's the same places we've been glitching to. It did not look good. Despite what actually happened behind the scenes, it did not look good. And that is very important to remember that a lot of the community was very upset at this point in the game. You had a relatively disappointing release and a relatively disappointing first expansion. And things were not looking amazing for Destiny. Until the House of Wolves started to get Destiny's shit together. So the House of Wolves then released the second expansion for Destiny. It introduced not a raid, but rather the Prison of Elders, as we all know right now as a kind of fun activity. I think overall the Prison of Elders, it had a lot of promise, it certainly got a lot of play, but at the end of the day, it's considered not as good as a raid. So that was kind of a miss, but it was nice to do something new. But it very importantly, the House of Wolves introduced a little thing called Etheric Light. This little material started to turn everything around because with etheric light that was earnable by doing the end game activities, you had to do the higher level prison of elders to earn etheric light and that was a great way to keep those end game activities relevant but once you got your etheric light you could use it on pretty much any end game piece of gear in destiny and transform it to the max light level. It was essentially the beginnings of infusion without having to sacrifice gear and instead using etheric light. This made everything relevant again. It was a huge boon to the game. You could now go back and turn all of your Vault of Glass gear into the new maximum, at that time it was the attack level, and then use it in the end game. You could use your Vault of Glass gear in the endgame Prison of Elders activities. You could use your Kurazen gear in the endgame Prison of Elders activities. It very much was the start of what we are actually experiencing right now with the Age of Triumph, where because of Etheric Light, everything was relevant. Both of the raids were very relevant, and the Prison of Elders was very relevant. And in fact, anything that awarded legendaries or armor that had good stats was very relevant. All these activities were giving you end game loot. And with the Prison of Elders, the grinding really subsided as well. You could now at this point go and buy materials from the actual vendors using different currencies. Honestly, the House of Wolves, although it doesn't actually for whatever reason get a lot of credit, it was really the beginning of Destiny as a franchise, as a game, turning the corner. It made you feel like your time was well spent. And that is so important because before that, it didn't feel like that. You would grind for hours and hours and hours and hours and get nothing out of it. You would do an entire raid run because you were just missing the Vault of Glass helmet and you wouldn't get it. You felt like your time was being wasted. But with the new systems that came with the House of Wolves, it didn't feel like that anymore. Plus, actually, they did something else that was really interesting that we wouldn't see again for a very long time, in fact, almost until Destiny 2, where they spiced up patrol modes, 
With the House of Wolves, you had actual patrol activities that were really, really cool. You would have wolves kind of invading and drop off a bunch of fallen with these ships and you had to kill them as quickly as possible and very importantly, it would drop a chest, and this chest could award up to legendary engrams, which at the time were very, very important, especially for PvP. And the best part is that you could actually go out of the area, so if this wolves public event was happening in a certain area in the Cosmodrome, you could loot that chest, leave the area and load into another one and get back as quickly as possible and loot that chest again. And you could do it like a bunch of times before the chest went away. That little thing made patrol mode lit. Like you met so many people, you saw so many guardians hanging out in patrol mode to try to farm those chests. Because additionally, those chests were awarded treasure keys that you could use in the Prison of Elders. So it made patrol mode another kind of end game, really fun activity to do. Unfortunately, and I think mistakenly, Bungie ended up nerfing this so you couldn't keep going back and forth, but it was still fun while it lasted and it was a great breath of fresh air as another activity you could do. The House of Wolves also had the introduction of weapon re-rolling, where you could take any weapon that spawns with randomized perks to the gunsmith and, for a price, completely change those perks. So once you got a certain gun, you had that gun forever. Like, you didn't have to go out and keep doing that activity. You could just re-roll it and re-roll it and re-roll it until you got the perfect roll. This is still, to this day, a huge point of debate within the Destiny community, where some people feel like that was the way to go. It certainly did reduce the grind. It did make it so that loot felt more special. When you got a really good scout rifle, like for example, the High Road Soldier, which dropped specifically from the strikes, you were so thrilled because you're like, I got this. I can just re-roll it until I get the God roll and use it in PvP or use it wherever. That was such a sweet feeling. And it limited the divide between the hardcores and the casuals. You didn't have people that had God roll everything Thing because they play the game eight hours a day versus the people who had terrible rules because they're just unlucky. You actually had a more even playing field in PvP and this angered the hardcore players. Surprise, surprise, surprise. But then again, you know, then again, it also had a lot of negatives. By reducing the grind, you're reducing a core aspect of Destiny because make no mistake, the grind is a key part of the game. Playing the game to try to earn loot and then playing the game again to try to earn better loot is such an important part of the Destiny experience. It's such an important part of any loot-based game. And so removing the part where you play the game, so you get the loot and then you have it forever, there's no reason to play that content again, that was not so good. So yes, it had positives, but the huge negative was that once you got the, for example, strike loot, your motivation and your reasons to play the strikes plummeted. And so you just saw a lot of players kind of get what they wanted to get and kind of stop playing because the motivation just wasn't there. And that is, make no mistake, a big downside. So we had big positives, trust me, they are positives, but we also had downsides. So in the end of the day, Bungie decided to scrap the system for the next upcoming expansion. And the House of Wolves didn't just add PvE additions, but actually added the biggest PvP edition Destiny would ever get throughout its three year lifespan, and that's Trials of Osiris. A relatively hardcore competitive game mode that will pitch you against other evenly matched opponents in the sense of wins and then if you go 9 and 0 oh, you can get a hidden treasure chest on mercury that you can only access if you go 9-0 oh. it was just such an awesome experience i know people hate on trials but just having it out there having that pvp endgame out there even for the players who have never got there yet Having it again out there and having that end game goal that they're still trying to reach, people who have never gone to the lighthouse will still make runs for it to this very day, still try to get there. And without that motivating factor, would you still play PvP? A lot of people would say no. But not only that, the loot you actually got at the lighthouse was fantastic. The summoner auto rifle, god that thing was good. 
the messenger pulse rifle. I still have mine. It was so damn good. You had so many amazing weapons. And, and, Trials of Osiris really bumped up Destiny's Twitch scene, which is huge. If a game has a thriving Twitch community, it has a thriving game. Like, you have people that play because they watch Twitch. And even just appearing at the top of the directory, you have a lot of people who have no experience with Destiny saying, what is this game? They go and check it out, they see a streamer they like, the game looks like fun, and they buy the game. Make no mistake, it is a huge marketing tool. And Trials of Osiris was probably the single biggest thing to ever happen for Destiny in Twitch. And it just made PvP have an endgame. PvP did not have an end game up to that point. PvP was just PvP, and every once in a while you had the Iron Banner. But now, you had a reason to go and grind PvP and get good at PvP. You're doing it to get better at Trials of Osiris. You want those god rolls so that you can beat your Trials opponents. That is a very big deal. Trials essentially acts like the raid for PvP. It's that end game goal everyone's trying to go for. But with that, we're done with the House of Wolves, and we need to move on to the next content addition to Destiny, which was the launch of the Taken King expansion. The biggest turning point for Destiny of its history, quite frankly. But even now looking back on it, I have to question some of Bungie's design choices. Because like I said, the House of Wolves was making things better. It did have flaws, but it was setting Destiny on the right direction. In fact, the House of Wolves is more comparable to what Destiny is right now at this day with the Age of Triumph because it had so many things relevant, because it had such a mind for the endgame. But Bungie decided to get rid of, frankly, all of that with the Taken King. It almost seems like Bungie was haunted from the ghosts of their past. We now know that Destiny had a very rough development and Bungie was getting criticized left and right from everyone including myself that of the flaws of Destiny at that point. It really seems with the Taken King that Bungie tried to start again, tried to start fresh, tried to make Destiny what in their minds it was supposed to be. Because with the Taken King, we got an entirely new light system. No longer was it just, you know, your weapon attack and then your armor determined your overall level. There was instead light levels. This was a much more forgiving system because most importantly, it did away with these huge level barriers. Previously, if you were missing even one piece of properly leveled gear, you'd be a level lower and that meant you were taking a lot more damage and dealing a lot less damage, which was hugely dissatisfying and frankly a very frustrating part of the end game. But with the light level system, you could be, you know, 5, 10 light levels lower and it wasn't that big of a deal. And most importantly with the light level system, you could have one missing piece of gear and it wouldn't matter that much. You could still function as a player, you wouldn't be getting a huge debuff. That is a very good thing. The infusion was also a very good thing, essentially replacing etheric light with again the ability to get most gear up to that maximum light level. That meant that the raid gear was relevant and everything you were earning in the strikes was also relevant if it was legendary of course. That was again a very big deal. It made every activity relevant, it made PvP, PvE and everything in between relevant in the endgame because you could infuse pretty much anything up to that maximum light level. Except for all of the year one activities, for whatever reason, Bungie abandoned all of the year one activities. The Vault of Glass, Crota's End, and the Prison of Elders were all not worth doing. This was a huge point of contention and anger within the community for the next year until the next expansion, which was the Rise of Iron. But Bungie really did leave all of this perfectly good content behind. I think the reasoning was mainly because that gear was too powerful. The Vault of Glass gear, the Crota Zen gear, especially when you compare it to the gear from King's Fall, it just doesn't hold a candle. Even now with all of the raids relevant, 
not many people do King's Fall. Not many people are excited for King's Fall gear because it's frankly not very good, especially when compared to the first two raids. And so, again, I think Bungie was kind of restructuring, reimagining, and redesigning Destiny. They didn't want the be-all and end-all answers to always be the raid gear, which is definitely an understandable point of view, but at the end of the day, it did cause a lot of problems. Because moving on from the Taken King, the next evolutions are really going to be, rather than full expansions being added, they're going to be free content additions. So we're going to get into that in a bit. But more about the Taken King. Aside from leaving content behind, which really wasn't that great of a thing, the Taken King was mostly positive because it really addressed and fixed the core, the internal aspects of Destiny that at that point were still a little bit lacking. The House of Wolves attempted to fix them and in a lot of ways did, but the Taken King really fixed, again, the internals, the horrible RNG. Drop rates were a lot more forgiving with the Taken King. Heck, in the sense of exotics, they were too forgiving in a lot of people, even my opinion, with three of coins. Like exotics were dropping like hotcakes when compared to year one. But again, this will fix that issue. Destiny no longer had horrible RNG because of the Taken King. That is a huge thing. It also pretty much entirely alleviated the grind. There wasn't as much of a grind because firstly, as I said earlier, the grind didn't matter as much. You didn't need every single piece of endgame gear. You could have a few pieces mi missing and still function in the endgame. And not only that, but just the way you leveled things up, the way you could you know, use modes of light to level up things, the way you could get materials, it was all alleviated from what it was in year one. So the grind, the horrible RNG, both of those things internally were fixed with the Taken King. This was a huge turning point and players who joined with the Taken King found those systems fixed. Like they didn't have to experience trash grinding and just horrible RNG. So they got a much better and much more positive view of the game. Destiny really started to turn around at this point. But the Taken King didn't just fix the internals of Destiny, it also added a ton of new content. For the strikes, you had entirely new and more improved strikes than ever before. Now you had randomized encounters, where sometimes when playing a strike, you'd come to an area and it would be the Taken enemies to fight, and other times it would be, you know, for example, the Fallen. That was huge, and that really did help replayability. They didn't feel like the same thing over and over and over again. Also, adding strike exclusive loot was a fantastically good idea. It gave people a reason to grind strikes to try to earn that strike exclusive gear. And as usual, the Taken King added a new raid. This was another huge content addition. Even though, looking back, King's Fall is probably my least favorite raid, at the time, it was still very good. And even a bad raid in Destiny is still a good piece of content. The Taken King was very reliant on mechanics. Some people loved that, most people weren't thrilled by that. And the one main downside is that most of the Taken King loot was not very good. You saw most people just use that loot to infuse into other better loot they had gotten in other places. And that was kind of a downside. Bungie would end up learning from their mistake with the next raid, the Wrath of the Machine, but for the time being, the Taken King, its loot again was definitely disappointing. However, we did have, for the first time ever, challenge modes introduced to a raid. Special things that you would have to do to earn special and exclusive rewards. This was a great way to spice up the end game. Just giving people who already beat the raid no problem a different and new and exciting thing to do. But also, if we're talking about Taken King additions, I of course have to mention the biggest addition, arguably, that this expansion added, which was the three new subclasses. The Night Stalker Hunter, the Stormcaller Warlock, and, of course, the Sunbreaker Titan. And this is one of the biggest benefits to the Taken King, and frankly, one of the best parts about Bungie, is that their class balancing is actually insane. Now, of course, during certain points of the game, 
some subclasses are better than others. In the previous meta, the Blade Dancer Hunter was very good because skip grenades were very good. Now, since skip grenades got nerfed, they're not as good. It's just how things happen. But, if I was to say, down to the comment section, tell me what is the best class, Hunter or Warlock or Titan. There would be a massive debate and there would be basically no consensus. That is how good Bungie's balancing is. And that's frankly phenomenal and that does not happen very often. With a lot of games that have classes, you have some classes that are just better than other classes and everyone kind of admits that, right? But with Destiny, that didn't really happen. Even with the subclasses, if I was to say what's the best Titan subclass, Defender, Striker, or Sunbreaker, there would again be a massive debate and I don't think that we'd come to a consensus. And that again shows how well these classes were balanced and how diverse they were from one another. So these additions of new, diverse, and super well balanced subclasses except for the first week of the Taken King where the Sunbreaker Titan was extremely overpowered in PvP and needed an emergency nerf, but aside from that, these were great additions to the game and are still having a huge impact. I can't imagine the PvE landscape or the PvP landscape without these additional subclasses. The Taken King also properly introduced us to Destiny's Weapon Foundries. Now we've had Weapon Foundries since Destiny first released, but they weren't properly expanded upon like they were in the Taken King. You had the introduction of Suros, Omelon, and Hakka, each with their distinct looks and perk layouts, making them pretty unique from one another. Even Hawk Pulse Rifles shot in bursts of 4 compared to the usual bursts of 3, so they felt different to use. This was a big addition, and again, it really kind of introduced us to these foundries. I get people saying when I say, you know, we don't have Soros shotguns, which have been seen definitely in Destiny 2. People say, oh, what about this random blue Soros shotgun from Vanilla Destiny? Well, they aren't really Suro shotguns, are they? They look nothing like other Suro's weapons. They don't have a unique perk pattern. They're just random blues that happen to be from Suro's. And that shows how disappointing the weapon foundries were in Destiny for a long time. So it's very exciting to see them expanded upon in the Taken King. And that's an idea that seems to be built upon in Destiny 2. We have the Vice Foundry being added and we have again those distinct foundries really popping on screen and an emphasis made on differentiating them from one another. The Weapon Foundries, I believe, was more evidence of what I was saying earlier, that Bungie was trying to reset with the Taken King. You don't just remake the entire gun system for shits and giggles, you do it for a very specific reason. It seemed like these Foundries were Bungie's original vision actually implemented. Now that's a lot of content, right? Well, you had to pay for it. The Taken King costs $39.99 US, or $40. This is literally twice as much as the $20 expansions that came before it. This was not super well received within the console community who just weren't used to an expansion costing this much. This, for a PC player, would have been totally normal. A WoW expansion costs, you know, almost as much as a full price game because it adds so much content. But again, in the console landscape, you never saw this. So it's kind of more proof of Bungie taking the ideas of MMOs on the PC and implementing them kind of for the first time ever on the consoles. At the end of the day, I believe the console crowd kind of came around and the Taken King was very well received critically, but it was definitely a point of debate when it was first announced. But speaking of paying, we then move on to the next point in Destiny's evolution, which is the absence of paying for content and rather having these free content additions. Or actually, maybe free isn't the best word as we'll discuss. The first one to ever hit Destiny was the 2015 Festival of the Lost. Now when I look back on it realistically, the Festival of the Lost 2015 was a fun little event that the Destiny community could go out and try to collect these different Destiny masks that just made you look kind of fun. They didn't even have a light level or anything like that. Uh, you could get some of the treasures of the Lost for free, otherwise you had to pay for them with silver, which was the new microtransactions system introduced into the game. 
really not the end of the world. But remember, this is the Destiny community and we expect a whole lot. And quite honestly, it was a little shadier than I'm making it seem. The main thing was that there were certain masks that were very desirable. These things were basically unseen in the sense that they had incredibly low RNG to be able to go out and actually earn. You had people that bought 50 to 100 of these treasures and tried to figure out the actual RNG of these items and it was around 1 to 2%. So incredibly low drop rates on the stuff you actually want. Very, very similar to the much hated supply drop system introduced into Black Ops 3 that very year as well. And I think that's no coincidence, because at the end of the day, Activision made a killing off of all these morons buying $100 worth of Festival of the Lost to get, you know, a special mask. Now they also introduced a bunch of emotes, which are actually kind of fun. I'll admit, I've bought a few emotes, they're pretty well done, and honestly, some of them are pretty funny, especially when you use them in the right scenarios. But remember, you've got to look back at this event from the actual viewpoint of the time it was implemented. And at that time, Destiny had never had microtransactions. We've gone over a year without it at that point and suddenly they're introduced into the game and they are unforgiving. You have the first time we see microtransactions in Destiny and it's incredibly harsh RNG and it was really not a smooth way to introduce them. So even though the items were cosmetic only and there was a little bit of fun to be had, the community wasn't thrilled with this first ever free content edition. And unfortunately, things are about to get much worse within the Destiny community. We have to move on now to the next free content edition for Destiny, which was Sparrow Racing 2015. This was a little bit more well accepted generally. Now that's because it actually added content in the sense of it added Sparrow Racing. Two maps dedicated for Sparrow Racing were added in the specifically Sparrow Racing playlist. A lot of people loved Sparrow Racing, it was generally quite fun to play with friends. However, RNG again reared its ugly head, you had most Sparrows only available to get through RNG and pay to win systems. Pay to win, I should say, pay to get what you actually want, not necessarily win. But it was just had the sense of trying to get every penny from you if they could. So yes, you could do the whole thing without paying a dime and that was still fine. But it certainly seemed set up in a way that you were encouraged to spend your money. Which, you know, did make sense. It is a business after all. But at the end of the day, it was, it was a cool addition in some ways. But it was also not as much as it was hyped up to be. The Destiny community was pretty, you know, evenly split between kind of accepting it and a little bit disappointed at the end of the day. But unfortunately, things got a lot worse because of just horrible communication from Bungie. There was a couple of really bad buffs and nerfs added to the game. At that point, and pretty much at every point within Destiny's history, Bungie waits absolutely forever to buff and nerf stuff. So you have to wait like six months with a meta that you absolutely hate. You know, I'm sure you guys know that right now and it's not gonna change. Bungie takes forever to buff and nerf stuff and frankly, it's not the way to go. I wish they had sandbox updates every three months because right now it's kind of ridiculous. So you're waiting, you know, half a year for a sandbox update and it finally comes and it's ridiculous. We had, hand to God, you'll actually see some of the background patch notes a buff to fast firing auto rifles of 0.04% for damage. That makes no sense. Mathematically, that doesn't matter. I remember doing the math for a video and it came out to you would have to shoot a player over 150 times for it actually to add up to one full damage inflicted on that player. Like clearly ridiculous. And Bungie's handling of this incident was even worse. They claimed that we had done the math wrong because we were adding, we were taking the full headshot number and then adding the damage increase and then saying it made no sense. Bungie said you had to do it the opposite 
opposite way. You had to add the damage increase and then add the headshot multiplier. But quite frankly, it made almost no difference. When you did the math, instead of having to shoot someone 156 times, you had to shoot them 153 times instead. It was still ridiculous. Like it still made no sense and it had no mathematical difference in game. You never saw, no matter which range you were at, no matter which gun you were using, a damage number changed from what it was previously to this sandbox update. So it was just horrible communication from Bungie. And this got even worse because matchmaking went to shit at that time. You were having catastrophic lag. If you think Destiny is laggy now, this was the couple months period where it was at its absolute worst. You were match made against red bars almost every time. People were flying around the map, lagging like crazy. It was just horrendous matchmaking. And we asked Bungie, what is going on? What is going on? Because clearly something had changed. Bungie officially denied it and said nothing had changed to matchmaking. And then, after weeks and weeks of the community freaking out, Bungie came out and said, Oh, sorry, we were lying. We actually did change matchmaking, and we kept it from you to do this experiment. If Apparently, if people knew about the change to matchmaking, they would, Oh, wait, there's like nothing you can do differently. So that explanation made no sense. So Bungie, quite literally, and this isn't me being a hater, and you can be as fanboy as you want for Destiny and Bungie, but this all happened. Bungie lied to the community about matchmaking. It was a really bad time in the game, and they eventually came out, gave not a great answer. The community was extremely upset. This, quite frankly, was very bad communication. That's not the way you treat your fans as a developer, is that you outright lie to them, you misinform them, and then you give them a really BS response. And, you know, for the previous incident, giving an almost insulting response, saying that, oh, you're doing the math wrong, when it makes almost no difference, no matter how you do the math. So this was a very bad time for Destiny. Like the Destiny subreddit, if you think it's salty now, it was filled with salt. It was unbelievably salty at this time, and rightfully so. Like, if you're playing a game and you want to have communication with the developers, you don't want them outright misinforming you. That was some shady shit. Thankfully, over time, it's greatly improved, and Bungie now, I really think they did learn their lessons. A lot of people, including me, I was very much taking them to task for what they said and did at this time. And so, now, when we see how well Bungie communicates and how often Bungie communicates, this is a huge upgrade from what we had in the later part of 2015. That was not a great time. But in the history of Destiny, we have to go over the good and the bad. Because thankfully, moving off of Sparrow Racing 2015, we then get into, you know, quite frankly, another rejuvenation for Destiny. We saw, as I said earlier, a marked increase in how Bungie communicated, and it was a lot better. And then we had the next con free content addition to Destiny, but it was the first free content edition that actually bloody mattered. It was the April update. Except it wasn't. And that's because the next content edition we actually got was Crimson Days. An event so forgettable, I literally forgot about it and I'm recording this commentary now adding it while I was editing. That should tell you everything you need to know about Crimson Days. It had a relatively fun doubles playlist with a kind of a unique thing where if you were the last guy alive, you got a big bonus to your movement speed and so on and you kind of were glowing red. The actual game mode was legitimately fun. I enjoyed it. However, really the only loot involved was a couple of different ghost shells, the sugary ghost shell and the chocolate ghost shell and that was pretty much it. Bungie had an awesome opportunity to add some unique weapons and armor. How cool would it be to add a unique auto rifle, let's say, a red auto rifle specific to Crimson Days, where if you had a teammate close by, you got a little bit of a damage bonus, or a little bit of a rate of fire bonus, or even a handling bonus, heck, I don't care, but just something unique that rewarded you from sticking next to your teammate, which was a huge part of Crimson Days. They totally miss the opportunity to have some sweet loot actually related to this event. And therefore, the fact that you had one game mode 
and loot that made no difference in any way to gameplay meant that Crimson Days was forgettable. But again, thankfully, we're going to move on to where things get a lot, a lot more positive with the April update. I still maintain to this day that the April update was one of the best content additions, paid or otherwise, to happen to Destiny. Seriously, in terms of free content updates, it's only comparable to the Age of Triumph. Nothing even comes close aside from that. And it is what all free content additions should look to be. Because the April update didn't just add everything based on an RNG system. It did certainly have RNG. It introduced more RNG loot boxes with exclusive and very desirable loot. You had the, I think it was the Desolator armor, which was the Takenized armor that came out of these loot boxes at, you know, a light level of 3, but of course you could infuse upwards. So it was just very desirable loot in these RNG loot boxes. Like, the Taken armor looked sweet, and when you collected it all, you got a free emote. Like, who wouldn't want that? Thankfully, you could actually get these RNG loot boxes through doing non-payable methods. You could earn one a week for doing uh, the Prison of Elders. You could also earn one for doing the first strike of the week, I believe. So you could just earn them from doing normal activities. You didn't have to pay for them, which was good. I ended up getting all taken armor, I think for all characters, without ever having to pay a dime. However, the downside of these loot boxes is that they introduced literally pay to win to destiny in the sense that they introduced the different boosters you could get a booster to your vanguard reputation and then go and do the strikes now it wasn't catastrophic pay to win don't get me wrong it didn't ruin the game or anything like that but in a loot based game where the point of the game is getting loot and getting the good rolls having something that you can pay for that you can just outright buy doubling your experience for a certain faction and therefore doubling the rate at which you get loot in a loot based game that that's literally the definition of pay to win again it wasn't that egregious and it didn't ruin the game but you would be a fool not to admit that there was a little bit of pay to win going on there and that did cause some contention within the Destiny community. Thankfully, the rest of the April update was so good, it pretty much, you know, it didn't pretty much, it completely overshadowed this one negative aspect. And thankfully now, you can outright buy these boosters with the silver dust that you can again earn through non-paying methods. But the best part about the April update was that it wasn't all based around these RNG loot boxes like the previous free content editions seemed to be. The April update completely redesigned and takenized the Prison of Elders. It brought that activity back into the fold because previously you had you know, basically no reason to do that. Now you were earning end game loot from it. Not only that, but crazily, the April update completely redesigned the leveling system. Now that seems crazy for a free update, but that's exactly what it did. Previously, you had loot dropping from activities with a semi-randomized light level. For example, if you were doing the King's Fall hard mode, you could get loot that dropped from 310 light to 320 light, and it would be random every time. So some people were just forever stuck at like 319 light, just unable to get that last piece of loot to actually drop to 320. This was a very annoying leveling system to say the least, like it just was quite annoying. But with the April update, they changed it so that now the light level of loot that drops, if it's dropping in an activity that can drop higher light level loot than what you are, will drop related to your light level. So if you're doing the Prison of Elders within the April update and you are, let's say, 330 light and the light level of the loot that can drop goes up to 335, the light level of the loot that drops is always 330 to 335. It will always drop a little bit higher than the light level you currently are. This makes a constant progression method. And this is so much better than any other leveling method we've ever had before in Destiny. 
It makes it feel that, again, your time is well spent. That when you're doing an activity, you are slowly progressing to that next milestone. In fact, it's such a good leveling method that Bungie basically didn't change it for the next big expansion, The Rise of Iron. And it's a leveling method that we still have today and is likely the leveling method that will be in Destiny 2. So that's a big deal. Changing the leveling system in a free update, but it was a very, very positive addition. And it also mattered quite a bit because Bungie upped the light level cap with the April update, so people had a reason to grind again. The April update also added the new Blighted Chalice Strike and remade the Winter's Run Strike to be Takenized and actually added a new Taken Shotgun as Strike exclusive loot. Like, this is pretty much as much content as we got in terms of Strike Editions uh, with the first two expansions, the Dark Below and the House of Wolves. So it was adding a lot of content. It also, really importantly, added old school weapons back into the loot table for the actual rewards for leveling up your Vanguard and your Crucible. This was a huge deal. Adding super desirable pieces of loot, like the LDR and the Longbow Synthesis sniper rifles back into the loot table really gave people a reason to grind. Like, I grind the hell out of strikes just trying to get those god roll LDRs, and many other people did as well. Also grinding their Crucible ratings as well to get all of that sweet loot there. It was a hugely beneficial thing to the game, is to add just more loot to give people a reason to go for and to play the game. The April update was a hugely beneficial addition to Destiny, and it came at exactly the time it was needed, because at this same time, The Division was releasing. And although over time The Division would somewhat flop, I don't want to say flop because it still very much has a loyal following, and trust me, although people hate in The Division, it has improved with content additions very much over time, but again, people were not happy with Destiny going in to the April update. So if the April update would have flopped, I think the Division would have cut a pretty big chunk out of the Destiny audience. Like, I really do believe that. Thankfully, the April update didn't flop. Far from it, it very much rejuvenated Destiny from this point moving forward. And now, moving on with Destiny's evolution, we now come to the next big point in the game's lifespan, which was an introduction of another paid expansion. This one cost $30, right in between the Taken King's 40 and the Dark Below and the House of Wolves 20, and it was, of course, the Rise of Iron expansion. This expansion, overall, was kind of mediocrely received. Like, at the end of the day, in my big review, I gave it, I think it was a 6.5 out of 10. A lot of people also, a lot of news outlets were also giving it 6s and stuff like that. And the reason being was that it just didn't add an amazing storyline. The storyline ended as soon as it began, and I would have loved to learn more about the Iron Lords and all of that sweet lore, but it explained almost none of that to us. Like, it was a huge opportunity for Bungie to actually do some interesting lore storytelling, and they didn't do it. That was quite disappointing. However, at the end of the day, the Rise of Iron was still exactly what Destiny needed. More content. Even though this content was, as I said, just above average, 6.5 out of 10, it was more content. It was what Destiny fans wanted and again needed. It added some new and Sivified strikes, it added some new PvP maps, it added a bunch of new weapons. In fact, the loot that was added with the Rise of Iron was probably the best part of it. Now, although, unfortunately, most of the loot was just kind of remade from year one, the Madder 64, which is now absolutely everywhere, and stuff like that, the Iron Banner loot... The entirely new Iron Banner loot that finally had a really unique look and feel, that was one of the best parts of the game. Like, the remade Iron Banner was a huge addition to Destiny. The Iron Banner was actually getting pretty stale up to that point, but completely redesigning how you level up in the Iron Banner in the sense that the bounties were now just overall for the entirety of the Iron Banner and they awarded huge awards including Iron Banner loot. So just by doing these bounties, even if you lost every single game, you still had a chance to get this Iron Banner loot. That was a very, very intelligent thing to do. 
And speaking of PvP, there is also entirely new Trials of Osiris loot introduced, which rejuvenated that playlist quite a bit as well. But most importantly, a new raid was added in the Rise of Iron. And it was one of the best raids. The Wrath of the Machine hits the perfect design space of not too complicated like the Taken King may have been, and also not too simplistic like Crota's End may have been. It's complicated in the spots where it needs to be complicated, but also relatively easy to understand. And also, very importantly, not so mechanics focused that you can't have a teammate die and still clutch it out. Also, the Wrath of the Machine had, I believe, the best raid loot out of any raid in Destiny. Now, of course, I'm going to have some people scrolling to the comment section right now, but I don't mean in terms of power potential. Of course, some of the Vault of Glass gear and even some of the Crotazen gear still tops Wrath and Machine gear, but I mean in terms of actually having proper raid loot. All of the Wrath of the Machine loot looks special. It looks like raid loot. It is sievified when you upgrade it fully. It glows when you activate its perks. And speaking of perks, all of the perks are unique. With the Genesis Chain having Focus Firefly, you cannot get any other gun in the game with Focus Firefly. And all of the other raid loot from the Wrath of Machine is the same way. They have unique perks that you can't get anywhere else. They're almost like mini exotics, having semi-exotic perks that don't normally spawn. When you compare this to even the Vault of Glass loot, like the Vision of Confluence Scout Rifle is good because it's an incredibly good Scout Rifle. That's it. It isn't necessarily super unique, right? The Wrath of the Machine loot, however, is very unique and that's what makes it so good and so desirable. Bungie also nailed it with the power potential of this loot. A lot of the loot is absolutely fantastic. The Chaos Dogma Scout Rifle, one of the best primaries in the game for boss DPS. In fact, probably the best primary in the game, well, aside from the exotic Outbreak Prime. And the Genesis Chain was on top as well. Don't get me started on the Steel Medulla. Like, you had incredibly good pieces of raid loot coming out of that raid. And speaking of the Outbreak Prime, that was another hugely awesome thing the Rise of Iron expansion did. We previously had some secrets in Destiny introduced with the Taken King. We had the Black Spindle exotic snipe rifle that was discovered randomly during a daily mission. No one knew about this weapon and then suddenly the community was all over it. The Sleeper Simulant was also somewhat similar to that and as was the No Time to Explain. But the Outbreak Prime got a bunch of the community involved. Like, so many people were looking and searching through Wrath of the Machine to trying to find clues and trying to find the fifth monitor. I spent hours in that server room trying to figure out the secrets. It eventually didn't really hold. But it was still a really awesome addition to Destiny, and it's an experience that most other console games don't have anything close to. Furthermore, we also had the introduction of special Iron Lord artifacts that had special abilities and actually huge game-changing abilities like giving up your super and getting double melees and double grenades with the memory of Felwinter. These were really cool additions and it shows Bungie experimenting with loot and not relegating that sort of stuff to exotics and actually giving us a chance to make builds. You can actually make specific builds with the Iron Lord artifacts involved and without them, those builds often would be pretty bare bones or in some cases not exist at all. So that was a hugely positive addition. And finally, we got another patrol mode activity with the Archon's Forge, very similar in design to the Court of Oryx, but it's still pretty fun to play even to this day, and having exclusive loot tied to it was a really good idea, and it made people play that activity a lot more than they otherwise would. So even though the Rise of Iron could have been a lot better, especially for the price, it did add enough content to keep Destiny fans satisfied moving into the future. Because we have to move past the Rise of Iron and now discuss the next content edition, which was another free content edition, the Festival of the Lost 2016. This one was even 
more hated somehow than the Festival of Lacoste 2015. Now again, looking back on this, it's hard to understand why Bungie did this. The first Festival of the Lost was not well received. Like, a lot of people were upset by the obsession over RNG and a pay to get what you actually want system. And Bungie did the exact same thing with the next Festival of the Lost. You'd think they would learn their lesson a little bit, but they really didn't too much. This time, instead of just masks, they had ghosts and sparrows hidden behind this RNG. Really cool ghosts and sparrows that everyone wanted, but you either got incredibly lucky with your few free um, actual RNG treasure boxes that you could get for doing the entire quest line for each character, or you paid for it. And a lot of people paid for it, so I guess at the end of the day, Activision won. But enough of that, we need to move on to the next content addition to Destiny, which was yet another free content addition, like all of the ones from this point out, which was The Dawning. Now this was concerning. We just came off of a not very good free content edition. Would this one be just as bad? Well, it yet again had RNG treasure boxes. But thankfully, these ones were actually reasonably earnable throughout the game. You could just get them for logging on every week, somewhat similar the Treasures of the Dawning to the old school treasures introduced within the April update. So they weren't as catastrophically bad. And it also seemed like the RNG systems inside these treasure boxes were improved a little bit over what they were in the Festival of the Cost 2016. Not only that, but the Age of Triumph also added legitimate new stuff to do, firstly in the sense of Sparrow Racing. It was back, it had two new maps, as well as the two old ones reintroduced, and it was a lot of fun. The four maps in total really helped. Having two maps in 2015, it made Sparrow Racing get pretty boring pretty quickly. But now that you had a proper rotation in the mix, it, again, it was a lot more fun. Not only that, but the Dawning introduced Strike Scoring, which is a hugely beneficial thing to spice up the Strike playlist. And it introduced exclusive bounties having to do with Strike Scoring, including ones from Zavala, which gets you an exclusive armor set when you complete them. These are all really good things to rejuvenate the game and to give people a reason to play. It also reintroduced, or somewhat remade, three semi-new exotics. It brought the Icebreaker back from year one, a very powerful weapon and right now, probably the most used exotic in PvP, a very desirable piece of loot clearly, and that was available for handing in the Sunrise Bounty, which you now got from Zavala, and had to do with completing the Nightfall Strikes with a Gold Tier rating. It also added the Nova Mortis and the Abaddon, the Solar and Void versions of the Thunderlord. So we had some new, relatively new exotics to go out and try to use. And for an experienced player like me, it was, you know, somewhat disappointing. I don't really need a Void Thunderlord, I don't really care about that, but from the perspective of new players, these were outright sweet exotics that a lot of the times they didn't have something like the Thunderlord, so the Nova Mortis was a relatively easy to get exotic that was at the end of the day pretty effective and they could go out and use. So I think a lot of players did appreciate these additions. So the Dawning, definitely not as good as the April update, not even close, but better than a lot of the other free updates we have had. I would say that the Dawning overall was a good free update. A lot of people were satisfied, there was more stuff to do, the strike scoring and the entire loot system and bounty system that went along with that was a very good addition. But we need to move on from the Dawning to the last free content addition for Destiny, which will bring us up to present day, the Age of Triumph. This content edition was, quite frankly, great. It was the only thing that really compares, as I said earlier, with the April update. Firstly, and most importantly, Bungie remade the raids. It fixed some of the old exploits, like you can't do a lot of the kind of cheesy things you used to be able to do in the year one raids, and redid the loot in a very intelligent manner, I believe. 
adding the elemental primaries back as exotics so that you could still use them in nightfalls or in strike playlists where you want an elemental primary and people still often do use them, I see them all the time, but then also adding the non-exotic versions as plain legendaries. So you can use a legendary Fatebringer, like I use that all the time when doing other activities. Like that was a very, very smart thing to do in terms of how to add these old school loot items back into the current redesigned as we've talked about with the Taken King loot system. It also added the featured raid playlist, which was being asked about for absolutely forever, where every week a certain raid is featured, and doing that raid for that week will get you ornaments that you can put on your new raid armor, which all of them look crazy. Like the Bungie design team went absolutely crazy with how that armor looks. Like the Crotazen armor looks insane. You have glowing green spikes shooting out of your armor. It's so much different than what we've had previously in Destiny and it's really a good reason to motivate people to do those featured weekly raids. On top of the fact that completing the challenge modes in the weekly featured raids was how you got the exotic elemental raid primaries. We also had the introduction of the big crucible bounties where you can get kills with a certain weapon and you will get an old school weapon potentially, like an old school iron banner weapon from year two or a year two trials of Osiris weapon and even a current trials of Osiris weapon. So those are definitely giving people reason to play PvP right now. We also had, finally, story missions updated. It has been forever. Story missions have never been touched since Destiny first came out and we had a daily story mission. But finally, now, they actually reward some decent stuff and a lot of people are actually doing them. And we had yet another RNG loot box, but it was the most forgiving one yet and one that you can earn freely through the most ways each week. So overall, we just had a lot of great additions with the Age of Triumph. And let's not forget the massive Age of Triumph record book, the largest one yet, and really just a reason for people to round out all of their different characters, to do a bunch of different activities, and to try to earn, you know, that t-shirt. Now the t-shirt, it's not the be-all and end-all reward of the century, but just the reason that it does exist and the reason the book exists is to make people play the game, is to give people something to grind for. And I think it definitely does help in that regard. But overall, the most important addition that the Age of Triumph added was that it made Destiny at its best state ever. That's what I tell people when people say, should I buy Destiny? I say, right now, even though Destiny 2 is right around the corner, right now, Destiny is at its best state ever. All of the best pieces of content, the raids, are relevant and worth playing. And you have strikes with the strike scoring system introduced in the dawning. They're at their best point ever. You've just got everything over time that has improved and improved and improved finally to this end point where Destiny feels like a proper, well-thought-out, well-designed, loot-based MMORPG. It's the game now that it was supposed to be back before it was announced. When people first heard of this game, I'm sure this is what they imagined. The state the game is right now is what people first imagined, what Bungie's, I think, their first vision was of Destiny. So it's really cool to see this game able to achieve what it was supposed to. And that makes me very excited as I sit here waiting for Destiny 2. And so guys, that is it for the video. The entire history of Destiny up to this point. Now obviously this video took a huge amount of time to make. So if you guys do enjoy it, please remember to help me out by simply rating and especially sharing this video. Those who do that are the real MVPs. Now, if you guys want to see more Destiny and Destiny 2 content, be sure to slap that subscribe button. Now, if you guys want to get in touch with me and keep up to date with the latest channel activity, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at RickCacus. That's linked in the description down below, as is my Twitch channel, which you can also follow. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, have a good day.